Hello, my name is Jeff Smith. I am Chief Programmer in the Enterprise Network and Transformation Solutions Group. Uh, I work specifically on the distributed platforms for the communication server product. Today's presentation is the Remote API Client and SNA Modernization. Uh, we'll be addressing how the Remote API Client uh, works with Windows, Linux, and AIX platforms and how it's a strategy as uh, we move forward to taking legacy applications and move them into the new internet uh, offerings that are available. This first page here is the trademarks and notices and I'll just list it here and go forward. For the agenda today I'll introduce what the SNA modernization strategy is briefly and then we'll get in and talk about the remote API client then we'll talk about how the modernization um, uh, for SNA and APPN infrastructure works with this product and then we'll also talk about how the SNA application access is modernized and then there's a summary and contact information at the end so first we'll talk about what SNA modernization is. In the years before <laughs> where um, uh, many of the legacy SNA applications were written back in the 80s and 90s I'll say, um, there was many many lines of code especially in COBOL that was written on the mainframe. Today um, there's still a lot of those applications around. The problem is is that the developers and those who originally supported are no longer available. Most of them are retired or expired. So um, there's, but there's still a very large contingency, especially in the banking, insurance, and uh, government type of industries where transactions are important and this is how the remote API comes into play but in the main strategy from stomp modernization the purpose is not about rewriting or throwing away SNA applications it is about preserving the core SNA business applications in an IP based network and it is about enabling the reuse of those applications in the new end user environments in an application transparent manner so basically we want to continue to allow the legacy applications that run on the host to run as they do as well as those in the distributed platform and we want to change that infrastructure in between um, both on the host side and on the distributed platform side so how is that done um, of course back at the turn of the century uh, the legacy networks were beginning to be faded out and be replaced by the internet protocol uh, pretty much worldwide in, in all uh, corporate accounts. So as that moved forward uh, there was a great uh, extension within the hardware and within the networks uh, to replace uh, token ring, a lot of the WAN, uh, wide area network type of connectivity with a total IP infrastructure. So part of that modernization is to take uh, what is known as the OSA adapters on the mainframe and uh, specifically allow them and configure them to run in the IP network. Uh, the mainframe system Z has got a very good TCP IP and IP in general routing capabilities and high availability all built specifically for the IP network uh, and its infrastructure. The next part of the SNA modernization is to simplify the SNA node topology and that's basically to take uh, the nodes that are running out in the network and provide them the um, uh, the IP infra IP technologies 
uh, to connect into the mainframe. So for instance, a lot of that is taking the old 3270 and converting it to TN 3270. Uh, the remote API is an example of taking uh, SNA applications that used to run directly over uh, LAN technologies and have them run as a client over an IP flow. Uh, so this is a way to update the nodes without specifically updating the applications. The last part is to actually enable the client technologies um, still using some of the legacy applications but now to enable them to use uh, HTML transformations and web services. Uh, that's basically another way to think of it is to um, webify an application uh, where it may be green screen in the old environment and now in the new environment you want to display it in a browser so that the user thinks it's a total internet web application but actually on the back end it's using the legacy application uh, all the way back to the mainframe. Now in making this SNOM modernization strategy real uh, there's probably two major activities. One is to modernize the SNA infrastructure and that has actually been taking place over the last uh, five or six years significantly. Uh, most all of accounts I know of in um, the corporate world have moved to basically a total IP infrastructure and there on the mainframe you'll find those uses uh, things of using things like data link switch and enterprise extender um, for some of the sub area type of solutions there's a communications controller for Linux that uses an IP technologies to take the older sub area stuff forward but in this presentation we're going to talk about the second part which is that SNA application access modernization and in doing that that is where you either update the node topology simplification or you can also enable uh, HTML transformation sort of like and do the webification of the application. Um, what we found is that as people implement the SNOM modernization strategy is that the network infrastructure has to be done first and then after that either um, the SNOM node access uh, simplification can occur or the HTML transformations and those type of application updates can occur um, but they they really aren't dependent on each other so that's what this chart is trying to show Now, as we go forward we're going to talk now about how the remote API fits into that SNOM modernization strategy um, there's actually two parts of it and but the first part is um, we're going to talk about what makes up the remote API client, how do you obtain it, how do you configure it, and what are major parts of just trying to use the products. So this um, remote API client is shipped as a client um, supported function on the distributed communication server from IBM, specifically on the ones that run with AIX and Linux. So there's two products, um, I'm sorry, there's three products that uh, you, would, you could purchase. One is Communication Server for Linux, Communication Server for Linux on System Z, and then the Communication Server for AIX. You can run any th three of these type of products in your environment and they'll all support the remote API clients. Um, on this chart here, this is showing you all the functions that uh, the distributed communication servers are known for and the last function that's listed here is the one that talks specifically about the remote API services that uh, is provided by the communication server in support of those clients. Um, many environments I've worked in the communication server continues to support all of the previous all the other six functions that are listed here and also at the same time you can do the remote API so none of these are exclusive of the others you can run all of these functions together but today we're going to focus on the remote API 
Now the remote API clients come um, in several flavors in the markets today. There's something that I'll call SNA API clients and these are SNA because they are specifically for specific platforms and specific servers. Uh, first you'll find Microsoft HIS server or the IBM communication server. They ship forms of a, a client that runs on Windows and these clients connect to only Windows servers and now that Microsoft has uh, pretty m much predominantly only focused on 64-bit operating systems you have to be somewhat careful on how you implement them because on Microsoft the SNA client if you install it on a 64-bit application only gives you 64-bit APIs if you stick it if you implement it on a 32-bit uh, platform you only get the 32-bit APIs for the IBM communication server there's only a 32-bit API support so whether you're running on a Windows 2003 server or a Windows 2008 uh, server R2 uh, one being 32 and the other one being 64-bit, you'll get 32-bit support, but it can only talk to an IBM comm server. The real strategic direction IBM has taken is to use the remote API client, which not only runs on Windows 32-bit and 64-bit, but also supports 32-bit and 64-bit for Linux and AIX. And of course, when I say Linux, I mean many of the different platforms that are supported on Linux being Intel, uh, Power, and the System Z. The remote API is strategic uh, not only because it has a breadth of platforms but also as we'll talk about this it also has um, been designed to support thousands of clients per server where the other Windows implementation uh, the best I've ever seen is a couple of hundred clients per server. I, would, I wouldn't recommend going above that number for the Windows, but for the IBM distributed comm servers uh, run on AIX, Linux, and also in System Z, um, there's implementations with three and four thousand clients connecting to each uh, each server that's available. The next chart talks about how the remote API is architectured to work with the servers. So on the remote API client there's really only three or four parameter settings that you have to de define which makes it simple to implement. Um, these three or four parameters are going to be first the domain name, second a list of servers that you want it to prioritize as it connects into the domain of servers and then third will be the LU alias mapping that you need to have um, for your application. The LU alias mapping is important because either you're going to map an entire workstation to a set of SNA resources or you're going to map specific users on that Windows or Linux or AIX client to a set of resources or you're going to map specific applications. There's many options that are available with the remote API client implementation that you do not have to um, you know you do not have to be hard coded into one implementation or the other. Um, and the fourth options are there are some timers when you talk about connectivity and it's somewhat dependent on how many clients you have per server and, and how much uh, time you want to allow for those clients to to have when there might be a network outage and they have to reconnect in um, but those are really optional parameters those that come with the default are pretty much sufficient for most networks now the communication server itself the servers that support the clients run in a domain the domain you could think of as being a cloud of servers so in a domain you can have up to nine servers and they share the SNA resources among the clients so that clients connecting into one server uh, will dynamically be able to access LUs on the other servers if the applications need to um, and that's good for high availability as well as load balancing. 
the other part of this um, design is that when you configure your communication server in domains you have plenty of options on how you want to do that um, you may decide that you want to have one server um, in a domain and you have multiple domains and each server is basically a duplicate of the other so clients connecting into a server really only get to use LUs on that server but the remote API client has a way to load balance and distribute its connectivity to the different servers so that no matter which server he connects to it always gets the resources it needs uh, and this is a way to do some type of dynamic, dynamic load balancing um, high availability so that if uh, one server goes down the client just connects in uh, gets another IP address from a domain server let's say and um, then from that it it's given access as needed uh, and you've also have the ability to do things like I may have different domains in different data centers so I may have a disaster recovery site that has three or four servers and a, my production site that has three or four servers and I might decide to put all my traffic in the production site until I decide I need to move it over to data recovery site um, and in so doing you can simply change the IP addressing that's being used by the routers or you may have the remote APIs themselves um, detect that oh the production site is down and it'll, they'll automatically switch over uh, and attempt to use the data recovery sites domains um, so there's plenty of options to use here um, basically the remote API client is a way to enable an IP connectivity for your SNA applications and that IP connectivity includes some high availability as far as redundancy and load balance and into the, your IP network so now we're going to talk about how this total solution of using a remote API with the comm server supports modernization of your SNA APM, APPN infrastructure which uh, you can think of as being the back end part or the the mainframe part of your connectivity and then um, the following section after this we'll talk more about what happens on the specific nodes um, in the remote API client now first let's just talk about what SNOM modernization means on the back end or in the in the data center um, today APPN is used in most all SNA networks corporate networks that I can think of um, because they APPN is a way to dynamically provide uh, SNA connectivity among your SNA resources so uh, first of all APPN uses um, an implementation of high performance routing over IP which is also known as enterprise extender uh, um, enterprise extender endpoints come in the market today on ZOS Cisco SNA switch uh, IBM communication server of course on Windows AIX Linux uh, there's a personal communication product that supports it and then Microsoft also with its uh, Microsoft HIS server um, and just recently uh, in the past two years or so IBM uh, i5 OS uh, or the old AS400 is often known um, has added enterprise extender uh, node support now when we talk about APPN backbones and enterprise extender it's important to make this distinction because I've seen this from several implementers who have tried to move off of system Z with their APPN connectivity and take advantage of maybe use another platforms um, in the architecture for APPN there's this one important feature called extended border node capabilities all right it allows you to connect multiple network IDs or disparate APPN networks together um, and that particular function is only found in the market on the ZOS platform so uh, a number of customers I've worked with has said they want to move their applications off of Z but they find that 
they if they have enterprise extender connectivities to multiple clients uh, or multiple um, partners they can't totally get off of Z they might be able to take their system Z from a large box down to a smaller enterprise business box but they effectively need to have that eight, uh, extended border node capability um, now the rest of the products um, all support the following functions within SNA there's this boundary node function that's the ability to connect anywhere within a network um, and in doing so APPN supports something called dependent LU requester uh, in SNA there's this concept of independent and dependent resources the dependent resources which require for basically the host mainframe to control all the uh, protocol connectivity flows uh, that is done through this dependent LU requester and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward another part of that is um, the APPN networks initially were provided a means to grow into very large numbers but uh, that created a lot of bandwidth on the back ends to try to uh, keep up with the node topology a design was implemented called branch extender which allows you to sort of segregate your network in a in a sense so that those endpoints don't have to know all about the topology uh, and they get somewhat isolated uh, that's an important feature that's provided in uh, the products like the, the Cisco SNA switch and the distributed comm servers that enable you to grow your network to very large number of nodes uh, but limits the amount of network nodes that are required in the network to keep track of it and the last part of this uh, foil here is this concept of uh, using APPN transmission group dynamic definitions within a node such that you be able to provide connectivity to any node within the network dynamically and that is using something called connection networks also um, known as virtual route networks and we'll have a whole chart that describes that advantage of using that this next chart is just a chart to show you all the possible APPN SNA functions that are out there in the market today and some of the major products that support that um, what you'll find in looking at this chart is that um, there is a high breadth of um, functions that are supported by uh, the mainframe as well as a lot of the distributed platforms but the ones we're going to focus on today is this remote API uh, client um, and so down at the bottom where it has the remote API function listed uh, the distributed comm servers there's there's uh, two listed there the comm server for Linux that also includes the comm server for Linux on system Z um, so those two products plus the communication server for AIX they support the remote API clients and then the PCOM product doesn't support the PCOM in the same I'm sorry to support the remote API in the same way but it recognizes it so you can take a product like the personal communications um, product that today may be used in enterprise extender or some uh, LAN uh, SNA over LAN called LLC2 connectivity it will also recognize that the remote API clients there and use that API to connect into the network so um, that's important if you have some SNA printer type of capabilities or something that typically um, isn't easy to convert over to a TN3270 type flow but that's just uh, that's just part of what the remote API supports in the, in the field now enterprise extender as we've talked about is a major implementation of APPN in the network um, I just wanted to go over briefly here on this chart in enterprise extender what are some of those key um, characteristics of it enterprise extender of course is high performance routing over IP networks it uses 
it's a UDP application and when you use it in an APPN network it the APPN node will create a link called an HPR link so it will look like it's linking to another APPN node over HPR um, the goodness with that is that uh, when it goes over HPR there's dynamic um, support for being able to switch anywhere in the network uh, but when you use that you have to understand that it's not a direct definition of going from one point to the other necessarily because Enterprise Extender allows you to have multiple paths through a network to always guarantee that you know, you, you're going to have non-disruptive path routing through that network you never are 100 percent sure exactly the path you're using um, all the time so uh, that's just one of the features of using APPN and HPR um, the other part about this is that the traffic inherits the APPN HPR characteristics um, and that includes being able to be non-disruptive so with an APPN and HPR if something goes down in the network um, there is the ability APPN will dynamically route find the next best route in the network and use it um, again for business co partner connectivity through um, enterprise extender the extender border node capability is required and that's only found on communication server for ZOS uh, the implementation for dependent LU traffic uh, over enterprise extender uses that dependent LU R and dependent LU server or dependent LU R dependent LU S and I have a chart coming up with that here in a minute SNA traffic is used on UDP um, datagrams and those are port 12,000 through 12,004 uh, there are some firewall wall issues to consider when using enterprise extender but those are pretty much well known in the market and um, oftentimes you know it's it's just known that those ports need to be open if you have SNA and Enterprise Extender connectivity requirements. Enterprise Extender is um, very optimal for doing data center to data center connectivity as well as any connectivities within data centers. Um, that is pretty much the preferred way to use um, SNA communications. Uh, the main nodes that uh, today support it are ZOS, of course, and then the distributed comm servers and the Cisco SNA switch. Those are the type of nodes that we see today being used for um, SNA connectivity. The uh, enterprise extender nodes have different capabilities depending on which products you're using. So if you're using Microsoft host integration server or it's the Cisco SNA switch, um, you have to understand that those are limited in their capability in other words Cisco SNA switch will always be a branch extender okay uh, the Microsoft host integration server will always be an end node it can't be used for routing traffic below it that's SNA um, so those are the type of things that uh, is, is good to be aware of of course the IBM products the distributed comm servers they support all the features of APPN be it a, an end node, a branch extender, or a network node capability. And of course, EE traffic at the end, it can be used um, in an IPsec environment to make it secure, uh, but it is a UDP implementation and does not use SSL or TLS. Okay, uh, Those are TCP IP implementations. But IPsec, um, Enterprise Extender runs over VPN implementations very well. Um, so for our next chart uh, this is where we're going to talk about how dependent uh, LU traffic is used or implemented in an APPN network uh, this is important because as we move forward we'll talk about how the remote API fits in with dependent LU traffic because the remote API supports both independent and dependent um, LU traffic so when you're understanding dependent LUs, the first thing to understand is that um, from a APPN node for doing DLUR, DLUS type of traffic, first there's an SSCP or DLUS session that is brought up between 
the APPN node that's distributed and the mainframe. The DLUS would be on the mainframe side, the DLUR is on the distributed side. Those are control flow type of sessions. So you, your data doesn't flow over these, but this, this particular information is how uh, you're going to connect to the actual endpoints where your actual data sessions are going to flow. After the SSCP sessions are set up, you log into your systems, and as you log in, then the actual LU to LU sessions are bound to the different partners. And as it's shown here, they can take a different path than the control flows. This is an advantage because this allows you to directly connect to uh, the applications without having to go through a controller all the time. So uh, in a network like uh, like is shown here, you you could have a controlling session on one VTAM, but another one is where the actual application is, and APPN uh, allows you to find the best path and use it. Now as we move forward, this is an example on an enterprise extender APPN node that also has HPR, right, and this particular node has two um, dependent sessions. All right, I brought up two dependent sessions to show exactly what we had on the previous chart. First of all, uh, as part of the enterprise extender connectivity, uh, you'll start off with your CP to CP sessions, control point to control point. Uh, in APPN, this is how the topology finds LU resources in the network. And this is, these are the sessions that are required for APPN to, uh, and Enterprise Extender. So here are my CPDCP sessions. The next part um, is to point out that here is my DLUR, DLUS sessions that are those control flows. You'll notice that the mode says CP, SVR, MGR. That means that these are the service manager uh, no, uh, modes or sessions used for DLUR, DLUS. Now the first time this particular system had somebody log on, logged in directly to an application that in, if you look at the bottom part of the screen, you can see the route there goes directly through uh, one network node to the end node where it eventually resides. So this is an example where the CP, um, the SSCP or the DLUR, DLUS connection is going to the same node as the application. So this is where the flow would be the same. But the very next one, the fourth one, is sort of like an indirect session where the application is connecting to a different mainframe, all right, is, is on a different mainframe so that as you connect in now, if you look down at the bottom, it goes through a different controller to a different mainframe. In fact, a different set of mainframes to finally get to uh, where the application is at the end. So this is a way to show that within an APPN network, uh, using Enterprise Extender, dependent traffic flows just as independent traffic in, in different ways, but there are some control flows that have to be used to monitor it. And notice that we have two dependent LUR sessions, okay? However, those are the data sessions. We had to have four overhead sessions to support that. As we go forward and we talk about why the remote API is somewhat more strategic than maybe Enterprise Extender in the remote nodes, we'll, we'll keep this in mind. Now the other part about Enterprise Extender um, and APPN is the ability to be very dynamic in how you connect into the network um, and provide access to different nodes. Uh, it's important as you implement COM servers with remote API that those COM servers have very good access to all the applications on the backend data center. Uh, one way to implement that would be that uh, as shown here, without connection networks or a virtual network, if you want direct access to all those applications, you have to go through and statically configure all possible routes and all possible connectivity. 
Um, and as described here, um, a connection network allows you to get around having to define all those static routes. So this demonstration here now shows you how using a virtual net route network, the nodes just get configured to be part of a virtual net route. They, uh, they have a connection into a network node server and the network node server recognizes that anybody on that virtual route network has direct access to one another and so if you try to connect to an application on a node that's also in that virtual route it will provide you the IP address and so Enterprise Extender um, will uh, bring up uh, a dynamic link uh, directly between the end node um, and the node uh, on the mainframe that's supplying that application so this is a way to um, provide direct access for your end nodes um, or for your remote nodes into the specific applications that are there. This you'll find to be much more important um, as you implement the remote API into a domain. You want to have all those domain servers um, to be part of a virtual route network or connection network. All right, now we've talked about the server side, the back end side, I'll say. Now we'll talk about how this is implemented on the remote API uh, and what advantages the remote API brings and why it's becoming more strategic as networks grow and, and applications uh, begin to move into a more webified type of environment. First of all, uh, this is sort of the direction that we've seen networks moving in the in the past 20 years, okay? Uh, there's a System Z up there, and there on the System Z you have TN3270, there's a complete SNA stack up there, and, and so forth. Down at the uh, the end nodes, I'm sorry, down in the remote sites, you'll have an SNA protocol stack with TN3270, or, or 3270 requirements, and LU applications, um, and as networks begin to um, move to the internet, okay, those SNA networks migrate into uh, this fashion here where uh, the infrastructure gets updated to support IP through that. So you're implementing Enterprise Extender, you're putting in distributed servers in the data center, you'll also find distributed servers in the, uh, in so in the branches and so the end nodes, instead of directly connecting, um, you know, all of the desktops to the mainframe, they'll connect to a distributed servers that consolidate all those connections, and then those connections are brought up into the mainframe. Uh, the other part is at the same time, there is a move to modernize the client uh, to simplify that connectivity to reduce the amount of footprint that SNA may have in those remote sites and move them more forward into uh, into an architecture that's more standardized. So uh, what we've found is that as clients update the infrastructure they also have requirements to standardize and simplify those access. So uh, the you know the use of web browsers for instance on their applications so you'll see more of uh, those type of things occurring in the network um, and we'll talk about next how the remote API fits into that so how does the remote API fit into this new infrastructure well you can think of the, this as being somewhat of a cloud implementation and here I have four servers that uh, uh, this particular implementation is going to use to implement a remote API solution. These four servers um, are, let's say, in the data center. They are, uh, they have access to an SNA network back to the mainframe, and there's an IP network as well that has the distributed applications out there in the environment. Uh, now, the first thing you need to do is first you want to configure your domain of servers. Uh, think of these servers as having duplicate SNA uh, definitions. Uh, the actual SNA LU62 node names themselves will have to be unique within the network, 
but they'll have common or duplicate LU aliases. Um, there will also be pools of dependent LUs that you can share among the servers. And as long as those pools have the same name, then I can pull anything out of the pools for those dependent LUs. And if you know a pool is filled up on one server, the remote API implementation is going to move you to another server. So here you're going to configure your connectivity to the back end. Let's say it's Enterprise Extender. And you're also going to configure a master server within a domain. And here I show two backup servers and one server that has actually no, you know, is not a backup server. It's just a server within the network. Um, notice that they all use port 1553. That's the standard port for the remote API connectivity. All right, so after you've configured a domain of servers, then you configure. Um, the clients. Now you may have to roll out a complete new platform like if you're moving from Windows 32-bit to a 64-bit platform. Uh, maybe one way to do that is you know you install the remote API client, put the applications on top and just physically move hardware out there. Or the remote API client is a thin stack so in one operation you literally can move um, your Applicate your remote API out to a client and install and configure it all in one script. You know, it's one command line type thing to do the install and define all the parameters that are needed. And we'll talk about that here in, in the next foil. But for this foil here, we're going to show that you first configure your domain servers, then you configure your remote APIs. Now, here for the remote APIs, all these particular remote APIs are part of the same domain and they list in order. Uh, preferably how they want to connect into the network. Um, so an example here, the list of servers in the domain may be to number one, two, and three, and four in that order. Uh, I may have half of my clients using a different order so that I do some type of load balancing. But remember that just because a client connects into a domain um, and is attached to its first server in the domain, it doesn't mean that the load balancing is limited to all the servers, all the resources on that particular server. If the application needs um, to get to an LU that's on server number four, but its main server is defined as server number one, the remote API client server you know, implements this dynamic resource assignment so that if my application says I want to use LU on number four, it'll dynamically create a TCP IP connection to that server, get its access, and get access back to the mainframe. So after we've configured your clients and you've got your servers already, the third thing to do is to actually do the LU alias mapping or the SNI LU assignments. In other words, uh, on the clients, you want to make sure that each application has a way to define what LU it's going to be in this domain. One of the migration issues that I see is that um, if this is an implementation of uh, currently of PCOM um, or some type of desktop SNA um, stack and they're moving to a remote API implementation um, on each remote desktop that has a full stack there may be a default that they all use the the default CP name of the current of whatever it is on each box so each box would have its own control point uh, and it defaults to using that control point for the LU into the mainframe as you move forward to remote API you just need to assign what the LU is for that particular box um, and so that's a, a little different strategy a different way of looking at it but it's easy to do that assignment um, all you have to do is assign an environment variable or you can assign something in a registry on Windows um, and the, or you can define something in the comp server itself that um, that the application is going to call and when it calls, it passes in the name of a uh, SIP side info, for instance. And from there, 
it dis the CIPIC side info has that type of information. There's many ways to do this assignment, so I'm not going to be specific here, but it's one of those things you need to think about as you move forward. The last thing you just need to do is actually get the application to run. When it runs, it should run unhindered from the current process uh, way of doing it to be able to do the connectivity. The whole goal of the remote API is to replace the infrastructure underneath without affecting the application. Um, in some cases, depending on how the application is written, there might be some static links to libraries that the application has to be relinked, not recompiled, but just relinked. Or um, maybe there's some paths that are hard coded into the application and those paths have to be changed or um, the paths have to be you know, uh, relink themselves or symbolize such that instead of taking that path, they take a, they find the remote API libraries in in the path that it's installed. I'll leave that uh, those requirements up to the actual implementation, but um, in most of the work that I've seen or that I've been been engaged in in helping customers migrate into the remote API. Um, only a few of them have had difficulty um, in having to have some type of change done to their application and that's you know it's a third party application and the application has to be relinked um, and those are the type of issues that you might want to look at uh, now as we move forward uh, the remote API client is strategic for the following benefits First of all, it removes the full protocol SNA stack from the client. So this minimizes the amount of administrations that's required. It also minimizes the amount of RAM and disk-based CPU that's used on that client. Um, it's a thin TCP IP stack. Most of the CPU processing that's done for that communication now moves into the data center. That second part here of the benefits is that it consolidates SNA into the data center. Um, you could consolidate not just into the data center but consolidate into your mainframe if you're using Linux on System Z. Oftentimes implementing Linux on System Z and the communication server enables you to take IP directly into the mainframe and there that's where all your SNA is now um, managed is in the mainframe. Uh, your SNA expertise is now centralized and the management is now centralized so that if you have to update your SNA network uh, you have a new connectivity partner you have to define new LUs new applications that can all be done now in a data center and you don't have to go out and touch the remote sites um, so it removes that um, it removes the need to touch the remote site as well as also reduces the amount of connect, uh, connections into VTAM reduces the amount of sessions coming into VTAM and we'll talk about that here in a minute um, the other thing is it provides the same amount of performance as a remote enterprise extender uh, connectivity the remote API um, uses one TCP IP port basically uses one TCP IP session for all the data um, it can also use SSL but it can use uh, whatever TCP IP security you have so it has capability of using an HTTPS connectivity which is secure but we find that instead of using the uh, specifically defined security that um, is supported in remote API that most customers use just the whatever security they have for their browsers or for their email for any other IP application occurring in their branches um, they use that same type of security um, so that really hasn't been an issue and as far as performance um, most of this SNA remote connectivity since it's transaction oriented is very chatty um, and so you'll find that if you use an enterprise extender and you move to remote API or if you're using data link switch and you used to move to remote API um, the latency that you would expect to go through an, an extra hop now in a server 
is not actually seen because these are remote connectivities. Uh, if you are in the data center and you upgrade your data center Windows platform to a 64-bit terminal server, for instance, uh, your clients are still remote and they still see the same amount, same type of performance as before. So there's no difference as far as performance uh, when implementing remote API. Uh, and in a lot of cases, it's at least as good or better because you actually reduce the amount of um, resources on the VTAM connectivity. So um, uh, it's going to be as good or better as any implementation using the Enterprise Extender or Datalink Switch or whatever else. The major benefit that is used is this last one. It reduces the cost by centralizing um, your SNA. Okay, The licensing in the remote API is going to be cheaper because you move your SNA resources into the data center. You're going to use less number of servers and you can also use servers that are priced now or based off of a uh, processor. So if you move into Linux on System Z, for instance, you you can now look at how much um, uh, how many resources are required on a Linux for System Z to support uh, my remote API, and I can license it based off of an IFL. I don't have to worry about how many clients are there. Um, I can put as many clients as there as an IFL will hold and I only have to pay for that IFL. So it reduces your licensing. It's also a, a green solution because um, most of the time these client, these servers, I'm sorry, are running in uh, some type of distributed platform, be it System Z or now Power. It also consolidates your configuration so that now you have reduced SNA re, uh, connectivity into VTAM and uh, your total cost of ownership goes down. Now, as we move forward, um, I want to just summarize here what we've talked about. We've got APPN infrastructure, modernization that is occurring in the data center, and that is part of what the communication server provides, right, with uh, enterprise extender connectivity, your DLUR, uh, your APPN connectivity, the different support that you have from APPN. Um, and it's very important to note that if you're in an APPN network, that connectivity to business partners still requires a ZOS. Um, but the remote API, um, as a summary, provides for you uh, the following. First of all, it's shipped with a communication server AIX and Linux, and you can use a domain of AIX servers or you can use a domain of Linux servers. You can't mix Linux and AIX servers in a domain, but you can have remote API clients connect into an AIX domain and use Linux domains as a backup. So the, the remote API will support running in um, to either AIX or Linux servers, but the domain itself has to be all AIX or, or all Linux. Um, and that's just because there's some features in AIX that aren't found in Linux and being able to mix them in a domain would be uh, just more work than, than needed in order just to, to support just a full domain of AIX or full domain of Linux. Of course when you're on Linux you can have all sorts of platforms. You can have an Intel, Z, and Power all mixed together. Uh, just think of Linux as being Linux and not uh, separated by platform. Uh, the other major functions it preserves, preserves your SNA client placement, right? Your, your SNA is still out there. Your remote API protocol, um, it removes your protocol stack <laughs> from uh, your clients. You transport um, your SNA APIs over TCP IP. Okay, so it only uses one port instead of four for Enterprise Extender. Um, it provides less overhead. Uh, as far as less overhead, remember in Enterprise Extender, um, there's at least four overhead sessions per node when you're doing dependent traffic. Uh, oftentimes, I'll work with a company that has, let's say they have a thousand branches and they're using Enterprise Extender today. Uh, that means there's 4,000 
overhead sessions that VTAM is handling. When they move to remote API, they find that they'll only have 8 to 12 overhead sessions. Um, and that difference isn't very major to VTAM, but it is some CPU cycles, it's some configuration support that uh, they don't have to manage anymore. Uh, and that cost adds up as the months roll by. So uh, those are some of the advantages of moving forward with remote API. Uh, it consolidates SNA into the data center of said, um, and it usually utilizes this cloud-like architecture. We've actually had customers who were planning to write their own SNA to IP type of conversion in their product, and they found that once they studied the remote API and you know tested it out, that it supported all the IP requirements they needed. That they just implemented the remote API themselves instead of rewriting their applications in the IP. So it is a, a good candidate for thinking about how you want to move forward in IP uh, for your applications. Um, the implementation is also minimal compared to other SNA implementations. Um, the remote API only has three to four parameters to worry about per node um, and oftentimes those are very easy to manage in a script so usually in one script you can install, configure, and have the remote API up and running and connect it into, the, um, into your domain uh, with very, um, very little effort. Um, and the, uh, the major part about the remote API that we're seeing today is that this whole issue about 32-bitness and 64-bitness in the applications and on the platform has become an issue. Microsoft no longer supports 32-bit operating systems. Um, they will support maintenance form, but all new developments on 64-bit, be it a laptop or be it a server. Um, and Linux and AIX have always had 32-bit and 64-bit support, and of course Linux hardware and AIX hardware only support 64-bit kernels now. Um, so those distributions now only support 64-bit kernels. Of course the 32-bit libraries are still there. The remote API provides both 32-bit and 64-bit libraries in all of its platforms. And so applications that are moved from 32-bit into the new platforms, whether it's Windows or Linux or AIX, those applications can run in the 32-bit compatibility mode, or if they have to be changed for some other requirements, they'll also run in 64-bit um, compatibility. So that's one of the reasons it's somewhat strategic, is that uh, it's the only SNA um, implementation currently in the market that provides both the 32-bit or 64-bit um, interfaces on a platform. Uh, you'll find the IBM communication server is only 32-bit um, and Microsoft currently only provides the 64-bit on a 64-bit platform or 32-bit APIs on a 32-bit but uh, but not both. So that's uh, how we've seen this uh, become more strategic. Uh, finally, this is just contact information. Um, John Douglas is our our main uh, product line manager. Uh, if also, if you need assistance in discussing um, services, the the product uh, provides um, we provide services here uh, to help do sizing, to help uh, actually go out and do proof of concepts and those type of things, and that is available as well from our area. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is that the Linux and AIX comm server has a 90-day trial version that's available on the web. You can go to the web page and look at the trial and demo link on the left panel and follow that. Um, and that's often the first stage people use to start evaluating this remote API solution. You'll get the remote API clients as well as the servers all in one CD image, uh, whether it's AIX or Linux and from there you can install and play around. The servers are time bomb for 90 days but the clients themselves are actually the retail version of the clients that we ship so you can install those clients and you won't have to update them as you move forward so those are available for your evaluation 
And the last part here is just reference material. I'll just say that the, the communication server for Linux has a quick beginnings and an administration guide that talks about the remote API and its implementation. And you'll find much of the details um, in those particular uh, guides. And those, are, again, are available on the web under the web page under the library page. I uh, thank you for your time and look forward to uh, hearing from you on any questions you may have. Thank you.